Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, I walk you through the simple steps of how to take a soil sample. Mark Bays joins us to reveal the finished product that's given new life to an old walnut tree. And then I'll give you a closer look at a couple of those garden kits that seem to flood the shelves this time of year. the doctor a lot of times when you're getting your blood work taken they want you to fast beforehand and that's so they can get a baseline of what your blood um, has in it prior to eating sort of what we need to do with our soil is something similar we're looking for that baseline reading to understand the nutrients that are in our soil and after coming out of a winter when we haven't done a lot with our garden space and put any inputs into it it's a great time to sort of find out what nutrients are in our soil right now. So as you come out of winter and before you put that spring fertilizer down, it's important to go ahead and take a good soil sample. Now today we're going to show you how to do it. It's a pretty straightforward process, but it's one that you want to do uh, accurately, carefully, in order to get the best results from that soil test. Now a soil test is a chemical analysis that gives you the nutrients that are available to that plant. Oftentimes you just need a routine soil uh, test, which means that it'll give you the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and also the pH of your soil. Before you get started though, you wanna identify the different locations that you want to pull cores from in order to get a good sample. You want to test different garden spaces, which have been maintained differently as different samples. For instance, if you have a lawn area that you maintain as a lawn, you might fertilize it and maintain it differently than you do your vegetable garden. Or you might maintain your vegetable garden separately than what you maintain your ornamental landscape. We also have another area in our vegetable fruit garden where we grow blueberries. Blueberries are known to like a lower pH, and so we have amended that soil differently than the rest of the vegetable garden. So these areas would be important to sample differently in order to identify the nutrients that is available in that soil. So today we're gonna to start here in our lawn, um, and what you wanna do in any area, regardless of the space, is to take about 15 to 20 cores. Now, if you go to your extension office, they likely have a soil probe that you can get. They come in different sizes and different uh, styles. Um, there's even a sweatless. So depending on when you're doing this and how hard your soil is, it might take a little exertion, but they do have sweatless ones that you can hook up to your uh, drill and simply drill those cores out. Now, the important thing is, is for a regular routine lawn and garden sample, you're going to want to take a six inch profile. So what we're going to do is we're going to, you can see this probe has already been marked with six inches with this tape here because we utilize it so often. So we're just going to push this down six inches into the soil, twist that probe, and then pull up our sample. So there you see we have our six inch core. Now we're gonna to wanna to take about 20 of these cores throughout this whole entire space. So depending on your soil, you can push that back out and then drop that into a bucket. Now you wanna make sure your bucket is clean and doesn't have any debris in it so that you're not accidentally adding organic matter that's not necessarily in your soil or any other foreign objects. So you wanna make sure that sample is clean as you put it in there. 
Now, if you don't have a soil probe, you can also use a hand trowel. A lot of them are marked with measurements. Again, though, you want to make sure you get that whole um, zero to six inch soil profile because that is how the lab is calibrated in order to measure the nutrients in your soil. So once you've collected your 20 cores, that's going to give us a good average sampling for this particular lawn area. So you would do the same thing in any other area that you wanted to test separately as it's been maintained separately. So at this point, you can see we've got our cores in here. Because the soil is fairly moist, they have kind of stayed in a, a clump. And we're going to remove any sort of debris that we might find in here. Again, we're soil sampling, not necessarily sampling for organic matter or any of this tissue. So we want to remove anything, if there's leaf debris or anything like that, mulch, you want to make sure to remove that. Once you have your 20 samples or cores kind of blended together, then we're going to go ahead and take a sample of that and put that in one of our sampling bags. So basically, we've got a representation of 20 different areas in this particular lawn that we've pulled cores from. If you had only pulled three cores, again, that's just going to give you a very sort of inaccurate look of what your lawn is doing. So the more cores, the better. Usually 15 to 20 cores is going to give you the most accurate representation of your garden area. If you, you can pick up these um, bags at your extension office when you're picking up a soil probe. But if you don't have them, um, they are free. If you don't have one, you can just use a clean sandwich baggie or something like that. But that's about the volume that you want to take into your extension office um, to give them to test one sample. Now, again, you want to make sure it is a clean baggie. And you never want to put your soil in the baggie and then put it in this, because this is actually going to go through the lab process. And um, they don't want to have to take it out of that baggie. So, Make sure that you just put your sample straight into this bag. Um, if you do take it into the extension office in a baggie or some other container, then they will transfer it into one of these bags to go to the lab. Now, if this was really, really wet, you would want to lay it out and sort of dry it, perhaps put it on some uh, newsprint or something like that and allow it to bake a little bit in the sun before you put it in here. You don't want necessarily mud going in here. So after you've gotten your sample collected and tied up in a bag, you want to make sure to label that. And so I like to just take a marker and write on the back of the card what area that was taken from. Now when we get to the extension office, they're going to put some coating on there that you'll need to identify with. Um, but for initially, while you're taking samples from one area versus the other area, go ahead and label on the back of your tag just that area that you're taking that sample from. Now we're taking a routine test and that's the usual test that most homeowners will want is just the routine sample. Um, and that will give you your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium as well as your pH levels. So that's the basic information that you need. If for any reason you want the micronutrients or the organic matter or the texture, salinity, there's some other tests that they can run on that, but those are going to come at an additional fee. The routine sample just costs $10. And for any other tests, you can check the website for more information about that pricing. So we've got our lawn checked, we've got our routine checked, and so at this point, we're headed off to the extension office. Um, I will say, though, that you don't necessarily need to get this sample to the extension office right away. Um, it's not like that you have to get it there within 24 hours or anything that this sample is going to go bad. You've got time. It's just a matter of once it gets mailed to the lab, it'll take about 7 to 10 days for you to get your results back. So keep that in mind as we head into the spring season. Well, this is truly an exciting day for us here in the Oklahoma City Park Department office where we have delivered this beautiful walnut table into its final place where it's going to provide years and years and years of just service to Oklahoma City. It's been a long process and it first started when this tree was just a log in the middle of a park in Oklahoma City. And it was this old dead log, it didn't look like much, but the Oklahoma City Park Department wanted to do something with it. And so it's taken so much time where we first hauled it to a mill and we had a mill operator slice it up, 
into slabs. And it just really, at first time, it exposed just how beautiful the inside of this tree was. I mean, hard to imagine what it looked like and what it looked like from the inside. And so then that started the process of drying the wood. And then we worked with some local providers where they donated a lot of their time and the material, and they planed it out. You started the smoothing out of the process. And after that, it was sanded. And one of the last things that we, of course, had to do to really enhance the beauty of the wood is that final process of sealing it. And it was really nice to have Kurt's shutters out of Stillwater do a wonderful job of this, where you would actually take the epoxy and you would pour it onto the wood and you would have to spread it out. And there had to be this process of all these little air bubbles were coming up. And then you use the flame to knock those bubbles down. And then the final coat of epoxy to really give us this nice sheen. Now, it's sitting here all beautiful in this conference room, but it wasn't easy getting it up here. Couldn't take it through the freight elevator because it was too small. So Oklahoma City Park Department employed Oklahoma City Glass to come out here, and they had to remove a glass window off of the second floor. And they used a crane to carefully lift it up through the window and it went through, I don't know, three or four different offices just to finally get in this conference room where it had to be put onto a, a steel frame. So it's bits and pieces that it had to be put together. So when they got all the pieces in here, they attached it with screws, the base, onto the underside of it. And then they lifted it up and self-righted it and now it's just such a beautiful, uh, treasure that Oklahoma City will always have. This is really something that started so long ago because we wanted to showcase the value of trees in cities. So often our trees get cut down in your front yard in a city park. They get just get chipped up or just hauled off to the landfill. And this is really a showcase project that we want to promote the use of trees in urban areas to actually construct beautiful pieces of furniture or other items from. So let's say you have a particular tree that you love that for whatever the reason it has to be removed. One of the things that you can do is to go to Oklahoma Forestry's webpage and find a map of where all the local sawmills are scattered all across the state. Reach out to them, say if, ask them if they wouldn't be able to mill out that tree. Then work with your tree care company, your local arborist, to make sure that they know what is needed at the mill so they can remove that tree to provide that mill with the most wood that they can make whatever product you'd like to make out of it. And so we encourage you, if you have large trees that you're removing off of your property, city parks, think about the things that you can make out of it, whether it's a beautiful table like this, whether it's a bench, whether it's anything. Just, just, think, just know that trees can have an extended life after they've lived their whole lives in our city parks or your front yard. Well, I think from the perspective of, of being a, a parks and recreation professional since uh, 1976, basically a bicentennial professional in, in parks and recreation, it's, it's always been my uh, goals to make sure that we are on the cutting edge of recycling and reuse of anything that happens in a parks and rec profession. So being able to have this table in, in the Parks and Recreation Conference Room is, is very dynamic to us. It, it, it proves what can be done and, and not just throw things away. Or if we can be proactive and have uh, tree harvesters on contract so that we can get them out and get them to explore and see what the realities and the availability is, that, that makes us even better stewards of the land and we know that that, that uh, old growth will be used for some productive measure rather than mulch. Well, once again, this has been a long project that it's just been a real pleasure to be involved in. And we really owe a great deal of gratitude for all those producers and all those people that volunteered their time, their services, their material to make this project what it is today. And I would just like to personally thank them for all that they've done. It's been a great partnership between the Oklahoma City Park Department, Oklahoma Forestry Services, and again, all those wonderful people that played such a big part to make this happen.
in springtime, we're so excited to get to the plant nurseries and there's a lot of creative marketing that's out there. And I know that I'm captivated by some of it as well. And I know it, sometimes it just kind of sparks my curiosity as to whether it really will work or not. But before you spend your money, we thought we would spend ours to kind of see how some of these um, products work. And so we have a few examples of them here. Um, we're not going to do all of them today, but we are going to start with the uh, Bob Ross Chia Pet and then growing herbs in a mason jar. But there's a lot of different products, everything from a terrarium in a jar to growing herbs in a bag to something that you just have to add water. Um, we even have some seed cap uh, capsules here that you can throw out into your garden. But we're going to start those in some flats and see whether they really germinate and how well um, they produce. So stay tuned as we get into some of these products. Like I said, we're going to first start with our Bob Ross here. Um, so when you first open any of these kits, you'll find a lot of times those instructions. And those are important to kind of look over. Usually they're pretty simple and they are written towards a person who may not know anything about gardening. Um, so they're pretty straightforward. So the first thing that we need to do is actually submerge this in water um, for about 30 minutes and make sure it gets nice and soaked. So we've got our, a pot of water here that we're just going to allow it to soak. You can see there's a hole. So one way to really submerge that even more is make sure you get that air and allow that water to go down into it. So while our Chia Ross is soaking in water, we're going to go ahead and look at three other little kits that we got. Um, and each of these are somewhat similar but slightly different as well. So we've got one that we can grow herbs in, one that's a sprout terrarium, and then one is for succulent houseplants. So kind of something for everyone there. But one thing I noticed that I wanted to point out when I was um, purchases, purchasing these was if you look at them, there was, a, there was a whole rack of both of these and there was, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 of these and they were very dusty on top. Um, and just the fact that there was so much dust on top of this herb one kind of signaled to me that maybe it was something that was carried over. Um, because the succulent one doesn't have a plant in it, um, but these other two actually have seeds. So if it's something that's been carried over from season to season, that can be a little concerning to know that it might be an old product. Um, and one way to tell is usually um, there are some, uh, some markers on the bottom identifying the seed germination. And we do in fact have that. Um, and so on this one that was really dusty, you can see on the bottom of it, that the seed germination test for the seeds that are inside here was conducted in 2018, which tells me that this was packaged up three years ago. Um, and so that's not to say that it might not still work and germinate, but that just kind of lets you know how old those seeds are in there. So if you don't have success, it might not be your fault. It might be that they're, the seeds have been mishandled in that time, been exposed to a lot of different temperatures and things like that. And so there is that possibility. That's not to say that this kit won't still work. Um, you might just have to use your own newer seeds. Now this kit, you can see, and it's printed on here, so it's kind of blurry, but on the side here it says seed test of July of 2020. So we know that this was just done this summer from seeds that they harvested and then packaged up and ready to go. So this is a newer product. So we would expect these seeds to not have any problem with germination. We'll begin with this herb one first and open it up and see what we've got inside here. So in this kit, we were able to get uh, two mason jars um, with lids, two small packets of seeds. One is mint seed and another is basil. Um, of course, we've got a simple instruction card as well. Um, and then this one, kind of the intention of it is to be able to grow some herbs and then cook with them. So they give you a kind of a little um, recipe book. It's got about four recipes in it. So the instructions are fairly straightforward. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and unscrew both of these. Um, it doesn't mention ever using these lids again. So I'm assuming we won't use them and that they were really just intended to hold the soil in there. Um, but starting out seeds, um, sometimes you want to hold that moisture. So I feel like maybe you could use them, but it doesn't say to do that. So um, the first instructions are to go ahead and put a half a cup of water in each of these um, so that we can get that soil media um, nice and wet. And looking at this, I'm a little skeptical that half a cup is quite enough moisture. 
um, to add to this. Now the thing about this is they are glass and so it's hard to remove that moisture. You don't want it to be soggy. Um, but after looking at half a cup on this one that we just did, uh, you can see the top of it is still rather dry. Um, so I think I'm going to add a little bit more. Before that, actually, I'm going to do something. I'm going to put the lid back on it and shake it to see if I can get that moisture redistributed around there. Um, it's helped a little bit, but I would still say it's a little dry. So I'm just going to add just a touch more to one of these. Um, so I'm going to amend what they recommend um, and add a little more moisture. Just say maybe a eighth of a cup more, if that much. There we go, eighth of a cup more versus what they say. But I'm going to go ahead and leave one with um, the half a cup and one with a half a cup plus another eighth of a cup. So. So now that we've got moisture in both of our containers, we're going to go ahead and add our seeds. And it recommends planting about 7 to 10 seeds. And I would say we probably have twice that amount in this packet. So um, you could probably get two uses out of this. Uh, this is the basil seed. So we're going to go ahead and plant. And what we're going to do is kind of scatter a few of those seeds along the top. And it's really hard to see because they are small, dark seeds. Um, and we're just going to kind of, it says to work that into the top fourth inch of that soil. Now again, this is the one that we didn't add the extra moisture to. And so you can see this is fairly dry media up here at the top still. So um, now in the other one, we're going to add our organic, uh, it says organic mint lemon balm. So lemon balm is a nice plant and a good one to have in the house because it's going to add a lot of fragrance. Um, so we're going to sprinkle those on top there as well. And again, you can just tell by looking at the difference, this is darker versus this lighter. So we know that there's moisture up in this potting soil. So we're going to kind of move those around. At this point, we're done. We've got our seeds planted in here. Now, again, we planted more seeds than what we want to actually allow to grow. So um, the instructions say to add two teaspoons of water every other day for the first week. And then after that, you'll increase the amount of water because hopefully the plants will have started to germinate and then they're going to need more moisture. So after that, you're going to add about two tablespoons of water every other day. Um, and as you see those sprouts start to germinate, we're going to do this process called thinning. And it mentions this um, in the instructions, which is basically simply going in with either a small pair of snips or your fingernail and removing all but the three or four strongest plants, um, because that's really all that's allowed to grow in this root space that we have here. Hopefully after about six weeks, we'll have some plants that we can harvest some of those leaves off. So we'll see how these go. In the meantime, we're going to make sure that we put these in a sunny window that allows for about six to eight hours of sunlight or underneath a grow light. So we're going to drain our Chia Pet um, because we've got the clay that's nice and saturated now after 30 minutes, um, but we don't actually want to have moisture inside of it at the moment. So something that I thought was sort of just part of the packaging is actually a drain tray. So we're going to make sure that we don't throw that away. We're going to place our Chia Pet on there. And at this point, you can see our seeds here, um, after soaking for at least 10 minutes, have a nice kind of gel to them. Um, and so that gel is going to help adhere the seeds to our uh, Chia Pet. We call these chia pets because we're using chia seeds. And the interesting thing about this is the chia seed actually um, really likes moisture. So it will absorb that moisture, creating this sort of gelatinous seed coat, which forms like a glue as you put it on your chia pet. So in our situation here, we've, it's a little bit more moist than what we want. So we probably should have added some seeds because you can see it's starting to drip off a little bit. Um, Bob's hair is wanting to grow a little longer than what we anticipated, um, but it'll work out. And then the other thing is we have some leftover mix of the seed and the moisture here too. So this is just kind of uh, waste for the time being. So once you've got a good coat on him, it's sort of like spreading jelly on, on your Chia Pet here. We're going to let this set for two days because we're just going to let it um, kind of adhere to that clay uh, pottery and then after that what we're going to do is then fill this up with moisture inside of here so that 
clay is porous and so that water will actually get to those seeds and help those seeds germinate. Um, and you want to empty out your tray daily um, so that there's no water standing in there. So another thing you can do to help with the germination process, and it actually mentions this, is to put a plastic bag over it. That will keep that humidity inside, again, allowing those seeds to germinate. And you should see that pretty quickly um, right after that. Once you start to see your seeds begin to germinate, you'll have about four to six weeks to enjoy your chia pets. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Join us next week on Oklahoma Gardening as it's time to pull back the cover in our garden and graft pecans. We will also see what this freeze means for our turf grass and share with you the gardener's to-do list for April. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.